Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord. I thank God uh, that his presence is here with us this morning and uh, that his spirit is uh, moving amongst us uh, as long as we are here in an attitude to receive from him. God is faithful to surely uh, not let us leave here without a blessing. Uh, Amen. So so let us uh, uh, remain here. desiring uh, to receive something from him. And I, I don't stand here, uh, I, or I rather, I stand here fully trusting that his spirit will empower me to bring his word. Um, and so with that, I'm going to uh, continue in our series that we've been talking about since the beginning of the year, which is titled, Looking Unto Jesus. Amen. Looking Unto Jesus. Um, and we have, I want to just uh, cover just very quick where we are in the overall plan. As you know, the first three months, um, January through March, we discussed who Jesus is uh, as he is revealed in the Old Testament. And even though God appeared to different people in the Old Testament, he also revealed himself and his plan uh, through prominent figures in the Old Testament. We didn't cover everybody, uh, but uh, we discussed and elaborated on a few key characters that um, brought the shadow of Christ through their life. We talked about Abel, we talked about Noah, Abraham, Joseph, and then uh, and then lastly, Jitu covered, um, we talked uh Sorry, Mo- did I say Moses? Yes, Moses. And then Jitu covered David and just summarized that section last week and touched on many, uh, many of the others that we didn't have a chance to talk about. So that was the first part of our series, which was the forerunners of Christ. Now, starting today, we're moving forward into the main topic that we have, which is looking unto Jesus. Who was Christ? And, and especially... Uh, today, I'm going to start with the beginning of that, which is his birth, which is our first uh, part of this uh, section. And, uh, you know, we can take as long as or little as we want it. And I'm going to just kind of kick things off and we'll trust in God's leading on how much, uh, how deep to go into each of these sections. But this first uh, part of it is talking about his birth and his early life. So just wanted to kind of give you a compass to where we're at. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go to uh, the next slide just to discuss real quick. So we talk about uh, his birth, and we talk about uh, the birth of Christ a lot uh, during one part of the year. And we talk a lot about that during uh, and leading up to uh, uh, the Christmas holiday. And uh, generally, you know, it's after Thanksgiving, but, you know, people are trying to move it up earlier and earlier. Maybe we'll have Christmas in July at some point. Uh, But uh, so from Thanksgiving through Christmas and maybe up to New Year's, we talk a lot about uh, the birth of Christ and all the various events uh, that the Bible talks about around the birth of Christ. And, um, and so it's unusual for us to talk about uh, the birth of Christ in April, right? Uh, but I wanted to bring to you, uh, and all of us hopefully will, uh, will bring to you kind of, you know, a little more deep dive into what that entailed and what, what all happened at the birth of Christ. But before I get started, you know, as we know, so there are four Gospels, and each of the four Gospel writers had their own style of writing, right? And that just shows that God is 
not trying to force us into become, you know, uh, uh, somebody that we're not, right? He wants a transformation of our personality, but he works with our personality, right? So he's not trying to make you like the person sitting next to you, but he's trying to transform your personality to shine forth the character of God. Okay, that's what the whole gospel story is about. So in the same way, each of the gospel writers have their own style on what they emphasized on and how they wrote the word, where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they have their own way of describing the same events that they witnessed themselves. But not only that, if you go further than that, they actually describe Christ's life on earth from the angle of four different facets of the same Jesus, right? And we all know this very well, uh, and it's discussed uh, in Ezekiel chapter 1, which is a vision that Ezekiel saw. But the Gospels, and again, you can see that vision in Revelation uh, chapter 4, but gospel, the, each of the Gospels show this four facets of the same Jesus. The lion, which is the aspect of him being a king, uh, which is Matt, the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Mark is the ox, which is the aspect of him being a servant. Uh, the Gospel of Luke, which is the aspect of him being a man. And finally, the Gospel of John, which is the eagle, or which is the aspect of him being God, right? And so from that aspect, we can see that each of the four Gospel writers chose to highlight or not even discuss uh, the birth of Christ itself. So Matthew uh, we, uh, talks, uh, you know, in the first two chapters of Matthew uh, gives, you know, a different way of just bringing forth the gospel, uh, uh, the story of the account of the birth of Christ. And he starts with the genealogy of Christ, uh, starting from, uh, from Abraham down to, uh, down to Christ, right? 14 generations of three each. And and God, so Matthew goes down the line, lineage of kings, and he and doesn't cover every king, but he highlights certain kings and how Jesus was born through the lineage of David, as was the promise. Then Mark actually does not talk about the birth of Christ, and he goes uh, covers the baptisms of a, uh, sorry John the Baptist, and then he starts talking about uh, the miracles of Christ and and on there. And Luke uh, actually spends two long, very long chapters on describing in detail a lot of the aspects that we know about the birth of Christ comes from uh, both Matthew and Luke. But Luke goes into a lot of details and Matthew doesn't. And we'll come back to that in a second. And then finally, John doesn't really talk about the birth of Christ uh, at all, but shows the picture before Christ came to the earth. Right? Who was he before that? So, so now coming back to uh, coming back to uh, so that that's the outline of the gospel and how they each of them lay out the um, story of the birth of Christ. And I encourage you to go read Matthew chapter one and two, um, and then Luke chapter one and two. And I would read encourage, and then John chapter one, and I would encourage you to read them one after the other, so you can compare and contrast how each of the gospel writers brought those stories forward. Okay. Now, but before that, there's more to it than just, you know, we know Jesus was born of a virgin, right? And that is impossible as we think about it. That, that is not how we understand how human procreation works. But actually... It is much, much more of a complex miracle than just the fact that uh, Jesus was born of a virgin. The fact that Jesus was born on the earth. And actually, I put up an analogy here. Um, I just want to illustrate so that you can help understand. Okay, so that's a football picture. But there's a play in football called uh, Hail Mary. It's wrongly named because we don't worship Mary. That's fine. Uh, but what happens in a Hail Mary play is if a team is losing and they needed one more score to win. And so they draw up a play that the quarterback from one end of the field will throw the football all the way into the end zone. So where they score the goal. 
and all the players will run to the end zone and the quarterback has to throw that football and reach one of his players and not an opposing player because it doesn't work. And it doesn't matter who in this uh, lineup catches the ball. As long as it's the team that's throwing the football catches the ball, they score, and then presumably they either tie the game and go to overtime or they win and the game's over, right? So that's a Hail Mary play. I just said this example to say the story of Jesus being born of a virgin in Bethlehem through the lineage of David uh, 400 years after a period of silence, it's like throwing a football from Oklahoma and reaching Fiji on the other end of the globe and somebody in my family catching the football. It's much more impossible to think about than that. And just like that team needed that catch to win, right, it's like in an action movie, right? In the nick of time, the action hero escapes out of the explosion and he runs away, right, and he's saved and uh, an impossible situation happens. The same way, just like this football example, unless somebody caught that ball, they wouldn't have won. Unless Jesus was born of a virgin and came to the world as a human being, we would still be in our sins. We would not have this victory today that we preach about unless that happened, that event happened. It is more impossible by me throwing a football from here and somebody, I don't have the arm strength. I mean, I can't even throw it to the other end of the church, so let me be honest here. <laughs> so uh, somebody in Fiji catching that ball. So the question for you and I is what does that mean to you? How did this happen? Because when God made man, he already knew that he was going to sin. But he saw you and I and wanted uh, us as children in his family. He wanted us to redeem him and he made a plan already. He drew up that play, the Hail Mary play. The difference with God's plan and, and this football play is he was not this last ditch effort. He was not trying to somehow come up with this plan to somehow save mankind. No. As soon as he sinned, he knew this was the only way you're going to win the game. Amen. This is that I have to die. My son has to die. And he drew up that play and it came to pass. Amen? You all with me? You all following? Amen. Okay, so, so Jesus had to die. And it was all based on this one promise that Jesus gave to Adam after they sinned. Which is what? The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Amen? The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. So, who is throwing the football here? Who's throwing the football? God is setting into motion this plan. So, I will say he threw that football before Adam sinned. All the players didn't know what was going to happen. They knew they are going to win. They knew the play is coming. But God set into motion before they sinned, right? And so that happening of the Jesus being born uh, as a, of a virgin is a fulfillment of a promise that he gave Adam and Eve in the garden thousands of years ago, okay? So, and you can see, and, um, you know, so many prophecies that were fulfilled when that happened, and each of the gospel writers touched on several of those, right? Uh, Isaiah 7, 14, it says the virgin shall conceive and, and, God, and a son will be born. He'll be called Emmanuel, God with us. I'll come back to that. Uh, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 says government shall be upon his shoulders, right? And a wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, talking about Jesus being born. Micah 5, 2 talks about that the Savior will be born in Bethlehem. The least of the places in the kingdom of Judah. Even, even the Jews knew that. It's going to happen. Instead of running to Bethlehem to receive the, uh, the, the, their Messiah. They put a plan in place with King Herod to destroy him. King Herod was afraid. Oh, is the king is born? Now my kingdom is destroyed. They were not able to stop the plan of God. Amen. Because the promise of God was spoken of Micah 
happened and they were shaking in their knee boots because it was coming into place. Amen. Uh, Jeremiah 31 15 talks about how there will be a wailing of Rachel is wailing for her children. There is a moaning coming out of Rama, which is talking about how Herod, when the, the wise men, you know, he told the wise men to come back and tell him where this king is so that I can also go worship him, right? And, and when he, they didn't, because God warned them not to, he was so angry, he gave the order and said, go, and he calculated, okay, about what time this baby was born, and he said, go and kill all the baby boys under the age of two. This was prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah. Again, analogy of the football. How did God put this plan into place? So precisely, and it happened as he had said it thousands of years ago. He already predicted. When I drew up the play, I knew it was going to happen just like I said. Amen? Amen. All of this will happen. Hosea, Hosea 11.1 um, just like Jitu touched upon last year, out of this uh, last week, sorry, uh, out of the stump of Jesse, a branch will shoot forth. That out of the lineage of Jesse, how did this happen? It is impossible that the this would come into place in so precisely that the Messiah will bo be born in the family of David, and that yet the prophecy, uh, prophecy was fulfilled. The reason I said that was because. When Jesus was born, there were 400 years of silence. Nothing was happening. Not only that, the kingdom of Israel was destroyed, the kingship. Now they were ruled by another sovereign nation of Rome. The Romans were ruling over them, and Herod was king over the province. So it is impossible because... The, is David's kingdom going to be resurrected again? And uh, that's what they thought will happen, right? They thought that uh, David's kingdom will be reinstated when the Messiah comes back. And that's why it's impossible because his kingdom was not the kingdom they were imagining. Amen? But God's plan was not to be stopped. So, so but when, when you can read... You know, it's like, uh, so coming back to the silent period, 400 years of silence, right? Think about from now, 400 years prior. You're talking about 1623. I mean, we don't even remember what last week's sermon was about, right? So, so 400 years had passed, and not only that it was silence, God was not openly speaking to people in prophecies and visions and there were no scripture that is credibly accepted as scripture included in the word of God, right? So it was complete silence. They don't know what's happening, but the promise of God existed. It's like when you throw the football, there's this hang time, and it's just hanging in the air. You don't know what's going to happen. And it's going a long way and going and going. There's everybody's holding their breath. And it's going so long, you're like, ah, it's not going to happen. We're not going to win. People turn the TV off and walk away, right? But God, who put the play into place, knew it was going to happen exactly as he promised. Amen? So, so when, when he said, government shall be upon his shoulders, that he will be a king from the house of David, when he told uh, Mary that his king, there shall be no end to his kingdom, He's talking about a different sort of kingdom. Amen? Amen. He, if he knew, if the devil knew this plan, I believe he would not have crucified Christ. Psalm uh, chapter 2 says, uh, He's in sudden rage, and the kings of the earth are imagining a vain thing. They were trying to conspire together. All the principalities, all the powers, and the kings like King Herod, you know, and Pilate later, conspiring to put to death and the leaders of the Jews, the Messiah, because they thought he was going to put an end to their way of life. Amen? But rather, this is a stumbling block that God placed. He kept it a secret because he didn't want anybody to stop his plan. Amen? Amen. So we have to understand our kingdom is not of this world. Amen? God didn't call us into his, his, this way 
to give us thrones and powers and privilege in this world. He did not do that. He came to pluck us out of the hand of the devil and bring us into his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Just like he showed that vision to Nebuchadnezzar, the, the, the stone that put to dust the kingdoms of the world. And it became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Yes, God will establish his kingdom forever. That will fill the whole earth one day. But right now, it's an unseen kingdom. Amen? And that kingdom is what Jesus came to establish when he came in this world as a human being. So just real quick on the silent years, and I'm going to keep moving fast. Um, so when we think about the silent years, it's uh, just like I said, it's the, you know, the football's in the air. You don't know where it's going to go. It's hanging out there. What's going to happen? But God was working. Even though nothing was, you know, evident, God was working. And many times God uses the worldly systems and people to fulfill his plan. So he was using, he used Alexander the emperor, his rule and his spread of his empire. He used that to spread Greek as a common language that was spoken. It's like English today. So that means that the gospel could be easily spread at that time. When Paul took the gospel, he was able to speak in Greek and people understood all these places that he went. Amen? That the Greek philosophy and thinking was so infiltrated in the Roman Empire that Greek was an easy... It's like going to India and speaking English. Any part of the world, most people speak English, right? It was the lingua franca of the time. It was the commonly accepted language. He, God used Alexander to put that plan into place. He also used the Romans. The Romans put all these roads and road systems into place. There's so many other things I can talk about, but these roads and highways and byways we talk about, the Romans did that. I mean, they had a brutal reign that they conquered, but God used them to put these roads into place so that the gospel bearers can travel beyond Jerusalem. They could, Paul and, his, you know, and many others who came after him could travel to all these unknown places to bring the gospel. That the gospel spread so easily at the time because of these things that God did during those silent years. Before, it was like all the things you do to prepare, right? So when you come to church, you do all these things to prepare to come to this point. You just don't climb out of bed, roll up in your PJs, do you? You get ready, you pray, you prepare to worship him along with the saints, right? So God was preparing his son to take the form of a human being. Amen? And then last thing I will say is, you know, if you read the account of Matthew and Luke and even in John and Mark, the one thing you see are witnesses. See, when God does something, he just doesn't do it in a vacuum. He has witnesses in place. When you go to a court and you argue a case, you usually bring witnesses to say, yeah, I agree with that person. That, that's what happened. So in this football game, you have referees and commentators. They're saying, yeah, well, that's what I agree with what happened. That's what happened. They won the game. This person of the right team caught the ball. The same way we had the three wise men. They were a witness. The shepherds in the field, they were a witness to the Messiah being born. Anna, in her old days, the widow who was a widow for 84 years, that's her sole purpose living in the temple, to witness the child being born as a Messiah. She was a witness. She proclaimed that God had fulfilled his promise. Simeon was a witness. He, he received the promise that he will not breathe his last until he saw with his eyes the Messiah coming. He saw the Messiah and then he died. He was a witness. Zacharias, the, John, the uh, father of John the Baptist, even though he witnesses miracle of his son being born in his old age, you can read in uh, Luke chapter 2, the song that he sang toward the end of that chapter, he's singing about the Messiah. How God raised up a horn of salvation in the house of David. He was a witness to the fulfillment of the promise of God. And finally, John the Baptist, he's like the commentator that we talked about in a football game, right? He said, I am not the light. The one who comes after me, he's a light. 
he his shoes i can't even untie i'm not worthy because i'm not him i'm just a mere human being but he was a witness and a proclaimer of the gospel it's like the commentator he does if he sees his team is losing he doesn't climb onto the field and try to throw the football right or catch the football same the john the baptist was not a player in this he was a messiah that you had to come in human form was god himself oops sorry okay well actually we'll stay there um so that that's just an outline of what happened at the birth of christ all of these things happened and that was the fulfillment of the um of the promise of god and the last part of my message i wanted to talk about this promise that god made in isaiah chapter 7 i want to read that real quick i referenced it earlier isaiah chapter 4 7 verse 14 this remember this was proclaimed thousands of years before it happened therefore the lord himself shall give you a sign behold a virgin shall conceive so when you see a virgin give birth you know that's what the promise happened and bear a son and shall call his name emmanuel so what is the meaning of the word emmanuel god with us amen so god himself dwelling with mankind so like i said earlier god did come and visit people previously god did make you know make appearances right uh, what do they call theophanies or christophanies where christ himself appeared but that's not what it's talking about here it's not god making appearances but god himself dwelling with mankind that's what happened when jesus was born but one thing you had to understand when you think about this is that christ preexisted before he was born as a human being amen that's why john uh, in his gospel starts with in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god amen he he is incarnated as a human being but he preexisted his incarnation uh that's why in hebrews uh chapter 1 it gives an intro of christ himself god who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets has in these last times spoken unto us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person upholding all excuse me all things by the word of his power and he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high and later in verse 5 for unto which of the angels said he at any time thou art my son this day have i begotten thee christ himself existed in eternity he when god made a plan to come down to die for our sins he already existed and he humbled himself to become a mankind and so when you think about this you know that when jesus god said you are my begotten son what does begotten mean to come out of right to be created from christ was god himself We don't know if he existed you know in the shape of a human being in eternity that I'm not going to go into that narrative uh it's got, it's a complicated topic but we know that Christ existed before eternity and at the right time he came into the earth so it was God himself and I imagine this in this picture that I uh if you can put that picture back up is God himself it's like the, if you take the whole ocean and put it in a glass of water can you contain all all of God in a glass of water amen or or can you contain all of the electricity in the world in one battery can you contain the power of the sun on one matchstick all of those things will explode or melt away at the power of God but what jesus did was put aside his divine nature he humbled himself 
to put aside, that's where you read in Philippians chapter 2, he put aside his divine nature and the glory of being worshipped by the angels just so that he can save us. Because he loved us that much. He put it aside and the ocean was contained in a glass of water. He took the form of a human being. It was not an accident. It happened perfectly and precisely according to the plan of God. Amen. And that's what we have to understand. When, when he did that, you know, so you look, come back real quick. The story of Joseph, you know, when that happened in, in those times, if a woman is pregnant, she would be forever uh, put to shame, right? Rejected. But Joseph received her into his family line. So when you look at the genealogy of Christ in Matthew and in Luke, is a genealogy leading up to Joseph. One came down through the kingly line and another came down to the natural or biological line. I don't want to go into that. Uh, it's a long topic. But you should know this. This is like God grafting himself into sinful human beings. That when Joseph received Christ into his family, God himself received us and adopted us into his family. Amen? So when we receive Christ, we are being grafted into his family. Does that make sense? That he receiving Mary and not rejecting her was like receiving Christ into his family. His whole family could have been ashamed, right? But he was willing to do that and he received Christ in that way. Amen? I already talked about his kingdom and the government upon being upon his shoulder. When Christ came, he came to establish the kingdom of God on earth. But it begins in your heart. And it's not an earthly kingdom. Amen. He didn't come down to throw down the Roman emperor. Or the Herod or anything like that. And to sit in a palace. He actually when he humbled himself. He became the least among. He was born in Bethlehem. The least place in Judah. He didn't even have a place to be born. He was born on the way and laid in a manger. Again. Are the least place you can even think of. He grew up in Nazareth, a place nobody even considered worthy to visit, and the least of all places. When his mother went to uh, do her sacrifice according to her purification, according to the Levitical law, you can see it, they brought two turtle doves uh, there as a sacrifice. If you look back in Leviticus, that was the offering of people who couldn't afford a lamb. Amen. In every which way you can think about, Christ confounded the wisdom of the world. He did the opposite of what you think God should have done. Amen? And he was born, he humbled himself so that to show you that the ways of the world will not save you. The, all the plans you had in your mind um, of how to win this football game, you would not have won this game. You could have used all your training as a quarterback to throw this football would never have happened. It would never have saved you. But Christ humbled himself to show you this is not the way that you win. It is my way. Jesus himself is the way, the truth, and the life. And I invite the worship team to come up. Christ humbled himself to be the least among men. And we'll talk about his death and his life here. It talks about how the degree to which he himself, he humbled himself. And lastly, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he says, Sacrifice an offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. The body of Christ. Why did God come in a human body? Why did Christ have to be born as a human being? Because for us who live as humans, who are humans, only a body in our likeness can be offered as a sacrifice. Amen? You can't offer anything else to, when you want a organ donate, uh, donation, for the most part, if you want a heart, you look for a human heart. Right? You don't go try to find the heart from a cow. It's not going to work. 
the same way God had prepared a body in, through his son to save us from our sins. And so that this ocean can be contained in a glass of water. And God, through that sacrifice, he saved us from our sins. So when we think about this, the body of Christ, he established, you know, the dwelling place of God, Emmanuel. God with us. God containing himself. But that is what happens when we become the children of God. God containing himself within us. The spirit of God containing within us in our body, which is also a temple of God. Amen. It is a dwelling place of God with us. But it requires a, an acceptance, a sacrifice that I am going to choose to live for Christ. You have to believe that God died for you. You have to believe that only through him. You have to believe that the quarterback is throwing the football knows what he's doing. And I'm going to believe that this person will catch the football at the right time. You have to believe that Jesus died for you. And give your whole life to this sacrifice. And when you think about that, I want to leave you with this. When the spirit of God dwells in you, that should bring this fear and reverence that to treat our body like the temple of God, right? That's why we, you know, when we preach about creeping our bodies holy and pure, whether it's sexual sins or whatever we do, it's not because of you're trying to follow a bunch of rules. It's because this ocean is contained within us. This temple that God has prepared for himself, this body that he's made for us, he wants it to be holy. It's not so that he's forcing us to follow a bunch of rules. But on the other way, on the other side of it, this ocean contained in us also gives us so much power that we can do unbelievable things. Amen? We can change the lives of people. We can do things greater, that Jesus said, greater than these can you, uh, that you can do through the Spirit of God. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Amen? Amen? The power that is contained within us can bring healing in our body. If, if we're suffering from healing, we can believe from a sickness that God, the Spirit of God, this ocean, this electric power that resides within us can heal us from whether a physical sickness or a mental anguish and can bring peace and comfort and joy. This is our hope. This is our assurance our blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. He's living within me. Amen. This ocean is living in, in this glass of water. Amen. May his name be glorified. Amen.